to trust funding. As I mentioned earlier, creating the trust, just went over why we use trusts, what the advantages are. We'll elucidate that a bit more as we go forward. But your trust doesn't really work unless it's funded. And what that means is once your documents are drafted, you have an opportunity to fine tune them, make sure you have all the right people in all the right roles, and that your beneficiaries are structured properly. The day of your document signing, you'll, you'll know if you've done this, that there is a considerable amount of signing that you're going to have to do. And then, in many cases, people don't really follow through. We try to make that not happen. We try to make sure that our clients, if they do enact a trust, take that next step because it is so vital to transfer and retitle assets in the name of your trust. So we have some documentation that we've provided to you. Beth told you where to find it. It's along with the webinar. And one of the documents, form number one, is a list of your estate planning documents. And we give you this on the day of your document signing, and it will walk you through all of the different documents and what you do with each one of them. How many copies, who gets the original, all of those details are addressed in this memo that you get when you sign your trust. And we want to make sure that we have access to your trust and the original trust when the time comes and it is needed. So those are the documents. And now we have another brief poll. This is a, a question, the most common reason that trusts fail. And this is multiple choice. It was improperly drafted. The trustee steals the money. Assets were not properly transferred to the trust, and tax returns were filed improperly. What's the most common reason that trust fails? All right, let's go to our results. Some still voting. And I think I might have given a little bit of this away. And we have a very astute audience. Sometimes the trust is improperly drafted, but that's not usually why you encounter problems when the trust is administered. What usually happens is the assets never made their way into the trust. So the third answer is the most common reason that a trust fails, and that is that it is simply not funded. So how do we fix that? How do we make sure that that doesn't happen? in your documentation, and we've given you this as part of today's webinar, um, no charge for the <laughs> webinar or the documentation. And one of the things that you're gonna want is an instruction letter. So we provide that to our clients in advance of the document signing and we re reinforce it and go over it at the document signing. But this letter is very comprehensive, talks about the administration of the trust and how each asset, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, real estate, business interests, annuities, life insurance, how each type of asset gets retitled and, re and put into the trust from a funding perspective. So that's form number two, the trust funding letter. When you go to a bank or a brokerage, you're gonna need to show some documentation. How is this trust configured? Who are the trustees? What are the vital terms of the trust? So we provide to you what's called a certification of trust. And this document you would take right to the bank, hand it to the banker, and then they would have all of the terms that they would need to open up that trust. So the certification of trust is form number three, an attorney certified copy of your trust. So we don't want the original circulating around yet. So we give you certified copies. You take that along with the certification to the bank or to your financial planner. And that's the document they may look to for further information beyond the certification of trust. And we provide you with a trust funding work, worksheet. And that worksheet will allow you to track each and every asset as it is retitled. And then we ask that you provide that worksheet to us so that we can prepare the last page of your trust, which is Schedule A. Many, many trusts that we see have a blank Schedule A. So you don't have any formal record of what is in the trust. We highly recommend that Schedule A be completed. And we actually created a position 
within our law firm at Pierre O'Connor and Strauss called a trust funding coordinator. And we have a paralegal who is dedicated to our clients and making sure that trust funding happens properly. Her name is Shanna McNeil. Shanna does a wonderful job working with you and with our clients for the trust funding process. And that is something that we think is absolutely vital to make sure your trust works for you. So what if you have a revocable versus an irrevocable trust? In a revocable trust, you're gonna put all of the assets in. In an irrevocable trust, you're gonna put selected assets in. And again, primarily our clients do this for asset protection purposes, sometimes for tax planning purposes, but we need to look carefully at what goes into the trust and what does not. With regard to retirement accounts, and many of you, this is probably a significant, if not the most significant asset that you own. What about your IRA, your 401k, 403b? Can that, does that go into a trust? And the answer is no, because a transfer of a qualified retirement account into a trust results in a tax issue. It's gonna trigger the immediate income taxation on all of that deferred income in retirement. So rather than put those assets into the trust, we will designate beneficiaries. And in many cases, upon death, tie the retirement account back to the trust, especially when you're using those beneficiary control trusts, which we're gonna talk a bit more about for the benefit of your children and grandchildren. The home absolutely goes into trust either side. And the trusts are designed to hold the home and to have it protected and also avoid probate and keep all of your benefits like star exemptions and capital gains tax exclusions. So all other trusts are going to be the same. And from a funding perspective, what about your tchotchkes, Aaron? <laughs> what about those tangible items that so many people fight over? That is true. A lot of fights. Um, so we use a generic, in the first instance, personal property assignment. Um, that's form five. So that's for things that don't have a title, uh, you know, plates, dishes, chairs, um, other furniture, watches, rings, that kind of thing. We also use a memo in uh, kind of tandem with that. So there you would put the specific items you want to go to specific people. So like my Rolex to my son, or you know, my diamond ring to my daughter, because we, we like to head off those fights as best we can. Ultimately, it's up to the client, but generally speaking, when the client decides who gets what, it's a lot easier at that point in time. I once did a on-premises pick a lot distribution of tangible personal property, because if you don't have a clear methodology, typically what happens is the kids sit around a table and in this case, we, we literally used chips mm -hmm. and the different colored chips led to a different order in each round. And so one of the kids kept picking the blue chip, which was the first. <laughs> so we, we, we then realized that she was putting her hand down so that she could actually see the blue chip and <laughs> pulled it out every time. But at the end of that, it ended up in a bit of a, a tiff and she picked up a bag of jewelry and threw it at me. And so you wanna make sure that you clearly identify and articulate who is going to receive each of those paintings, the books, the collections, and this document, the way the trust works, it's very clear. You keep that record, that list that Aaron talked about, we provide you with the form, but you can keep that, change it, alter it whenever you choose, and just make sure we have a copy so that it, when it does get administered, we know exactly where those types of things are going. Uh, but it is important to think about Sometimes it isn't because it's mostly family, family memorabilia and the children will decide and they'll figure it out and they get along, but not in every case. So the more you can do upfront and the more you can identify and put into this form, the better off you're gonna leave it and the more peace there will be among your beneficiaries when you're gone. Retirement accounts, as I mentioned earlier, get very special treatment and we had legislation that went into effect January 1 of last year. So 1120, the SECURE Act took effect. And the SECURE Act changed a number of rules. We actually have a webinar on the SECURE Act changes, the full hour of SECURE Act information on our website. 
And you can always access our web library, our video library on purelaw.com. Go to the resources tab. Go to the, actually, it's a separate tab for videos now that we have so many. So you can go to the video tab and you can access all the things that we have. And Secure Act extended the age, the mandatory distribution age to age 72 from 70 and a half. It allowed you to continue to contribute to your retirement account beyond age 70, you used to have to stop contributions, but if you're working and earning income, that's what goes into an IRA, you can continue to fund it. Those were the giveaways or the givebacks by the government. What they took was the ability of the beneficiary to stretch the IRA, meaning when I inherit an IRA from a parent, I used to be able to take it over my life expectancy and stretch out the payment so you minimize the income tax bite. What the SECURE Act brought us was a mandatory 10-year payout. So now each beneficiary has to liquidate or exhaust that account over 10 years. So very often, we will name a trust as the beneficiary of the IRA 401k, especially, as I said, when we do the beneficiary control trusts. But this is a very highly technical area fraught with tax peril. And we use actually separate trusts, which are designed specifically for large retirement accounts. We call it a standalone retirement trust. And that particular trust is specifically designed to maximize the benefits, minimize the taxes on the distributions to the beneficiaries. We talk again all about that, what the exceptions to the new 10-year rule are on our webinar. So we highly recommend that you check that out. If a part of your estate is a retirement account. You owe it to yourself to know how those rules work for your beneficiaries and how you can weave that retirement account, Aaron, into your trust plan. So a revocable trust is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So the, the grantor, again, is the person establishing the trust, sometimes called a settlor or a trustor. Okay, They put their assets, uh, husband and wife or a single person, into the revocable trust. They are the trustee as well, and they are the beneficiary. So you, in this situation, you're wearing all three hats. Uh, you can do with the income and the principal as you choose. And then at death, uh, well, even before death, at incapacity, you've set a, a plan for someone to step in and manage your assets as you've managed them. And then at death, you've spelled out how you want to go. Maybe you've created downstream trusts and you've uh, created a seamless plan that if you funded your trust correctly, no probate will be required. And I can't tell you how much that saves your beneficiaries, your family, your spouse, and people end up in probate. They don't have clear title. They don't know what their assets are, how they're structured. The beneficiaries don't. And your executor is going to face some real significant issues. There are specific cases, Aaron, where probate really must be avoided. Sure. And, and some of those are so uh, we just saw one recently where two beneficiaries are under a disability uh, in the form of mental illness. So that really uh, gums up the works from the perspective of they can't sign a waiver, meaning that they can't say that uh, in a legal, from a legal point of view that this is the correct last will and testament. So a citation has to be issued. And not only that, but then a guardian ad litem is going to be appointed for those people, meaning that it's going to be a much longer and drawn out process. Um, you want to avoid it when there's any kind of what we, the law calls incompetence. So that may be an older person who's lost capacity. It may be a minor. Those are situations you want to avoid. And if you need to do something quickly, so if there's real property in an estate and these situations arise, it's going to be difficult to manage before someone is appointed. So Aaron, when the judge appoints a guardian ad litem and that guardian ad litem has to go out and do an investigation, interview all the parties, draft a report back to the court, who pays for all that? The estate pays for that. So again, that's kind of uh, money out the window. Uh, it's an avoidable uh, you know, situation because you can do everything that you could have done through a will in a trust and you would not have that situation. You don't need a waiver for a trust. Um, the next trustee in line steps up, we give them a new certification of trust and they're in control immediately. In a probate situation, it's, it's very much different. Uh, our new partner in New York let us know that she filed a motion in a probate court last May, which has not yet been entered into the system. So that's over a year and a half before it's even been looked at. 
So in a best case scenario, probate may take a year if everybody's on board and it goes very, very smoothly. But we've had probate estates that were nine, 10 years yes. where, where parties are squabbling and things aren't going so clearly. And a lot of attorneys used to think that having a will and using the court and going through probate was a more secure way to distribute assets if you had potential contests. If you, if you knew that you're disinheriting a child for a particular reason and you knew that they were gonna contest the will, people used to use the will to do that. But now I think a lot of people have shifted. I think the opposite the is true because yeah. if you're gonna have a contest, it's much more difficult for someone to contest a trust. Um, they have to go hire a lawyer. They're gonna to have to flunk down a retainer then going to have to petition a court in the first instance to say what's wrong with this trust. And the burden is on them to do that. When you use a will, the burden is on the person propounding the will, which is the person filing the will, to say this is the last will and testament. Hopefully there's an affidavit there from the witnesses saying that everything is in order, but that process has to play out. And if someone objects, it can be nine months, a year, two years before the will is admitted to probate. And that process lends itself to litigation because if you don't sign a waiver or you appear on a citation date and say, I think I'm going to object, you're off to the races with the litigation. And there's something called pro se litigants. And those are people who are representing themselves. Now, in law school, all the professors told you any attorney that represents himself has a fool for a client. But a lot of clients don't want to pay a lawyer. So they just want to show up and appear and object. And they can do that in probate. Absolutely. And they can continue on usually badly uh, and drag it out. And the court unfortunately has to kind of bend over backwards for a pro se person and give them some leeway that they would not give to a lawyer. So uh, a pro se litigant is, is generally worse than an actual attorney. We have a, one estate that we're administering right now that it's not going well because they keep raising frivolous and specious objections with no evidence and it just is extending the term and the amount of money that they're paying us. You know, we, we win, lawyers win in probate with a contested estate, Absolutely. but the parties don't. And so a trust will allow you to administer the trust, make those distributions. And if anybody wants to challenge, they have to go out and hire their own lawyer. They have to pay that lawyer. They have to pay the court filing fees. They have to draft a summons and complaint and they have to serve it on the trustee. So it's a much higher bar. You can't just show up and object if you're using a trust. So from a funding perspective, we wanna make sure we have everything in. We talked about how brokerage accounts and bank accounts go in. With real estate, you do deeds. If you have a corporation or an LLC, you do assignments of those stock or membership interests in. We talked about tangible personal property, but what about assets that can't just be assigned in because they have a certificate of title? And this is a question that a lot of clients ask. What about a car? What about a boat? What about a trailer that has a certificate of title? That certificate of title governs that, that asset. That's absolutely true. And um, they can be transferred to a trust. Sometimes it's difficult, other times it's not. But uh, one vehicle can be usually transferred at death if it's below 25,000. That is, in today's world, sometimes the vehicle is worth below 25,000, but other times it's not. So the uh, vehicle, automobile, or anything with a title uh, needs to be looked at as well. So you can retitle it in the name of the trust. The only thing you want to make sure is that you alert your insurance company. So when you do this, whether you put your home in or your car in, alert your insurance company that the title has changed and they will add that right to the insurance policy. So vehicles can go in with a revocable trust. We want everything in the trust to avoid probate. Aaron, what about our Medicaid Asset Protection Trust and Irrevocable Trust, a little bit different. Yeah, so here you're not necessarily going to put every asset you own in, okay? So this really depends on timing and help uh, where you're at. So generally speaking, we almost always start with a home. If you have a home, maybe you're in your late 50s, early 60s, and you wanna get out in front of this. So we're gonna create that trust and put your home in there. It's not gonna affect anything for you on a daily basis. You still have the right to live there. You're still responsible for all the carrying costs. If it's sold, you still get your capital gains exemption. So those are all important things. Uh, otherwise, we may put some cash in here. Life insurance is an easy one to put in here if you're not planning on cashing it during your lifetime. 
everything else has to be done uh, in light of the health and age situation, whether we're going to apply for Medicaid proactively at that point in time. So that acronym you see in the box, MAPT, that's what we lovingly refer to as the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. So this is a trust designed to get you out in front of the five-year look back. We have new rules for Medicaid that are imposing a 30-month or two-and-a-half-year look back for home care. And you want to make sure you watch our video we just did. And we have another one coming up on the 21st regarding Medicaid home care and that look back. But Aaron, you don't have all the hats in this one. So you have Correct. different players. So um, you're going to uh, appoint someone else as your trustee here. Most times it's children. It doesn't have to be. Uh, sometimes it's your CPA, sometimes it's your best friend, sometimes it's a, an aunt or an uncle or a cousin. It just, generally speaking, is not going to be you because we want to protect these assets and we want to measure of a wall between you from a control perspective. Um, the trustee, though, you can remove at any time. So if for some reason your relationship with your trustee uh, goes south, isn't good, you can always change that. You can always change your beneficiaries at any time. A lot of times a trustee here is a beneficiary. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, in this trust, you are entitled to grant or you to all income. So if there's uh, dividends or interest coming from an account in here or uh, net rent, that could go out to you. Uh, principal is gonna stay in the trust. We carefully draft this trust though. So there is an ability to get principal out to you. And that's done through the children, typically. Typically through children. We name them as lifetime beneficiaries. Uh, if you need money for, I don't know, that trip around the world you wanted to take, your children, uh, trustee would write a check to one of your children and then you would turn around. They would turn around and give that back to you. We were often asked if that's a taxable event. It's only a taxable event from the point of a gift tax, which is not really uh, applicable here, but it can be over the annual exclusion, which technically you should file a gift tax return for. So when we're doing Medicaid planning, there are certain items that you keep out of the trust. And those include some cash because you wanna make sure you can pay bills. The number right now, if you're an individual, not a married couple, is $15,950. That's what you can keep in cash or other assets that you're allowed as your Medicaid allowance, $15,950. What you put into the trust is not countable toward that. You'll also see there that we have IRAs and 401ks. Why? Because for Medicaid in New York, they are already exempt if you're receiving payments. If you're not 70 and a half or 72 yet, and you're not taking mandatory distributions, you can take voluntary distributions. And if you're taking distributions, those accounts are exempt for Medicaid. So when we do our diagrams and our flow charts, your IRA's 401k stay in your name. That's fine. You continue to get the distributions, the RMDs from those accounts, but they're exempt for Medicaid purposes already. The other side is the assets, your home, your bank accounts, your brokerage accounts, the other assets that we had in the other slide, they go into this trust. As Aaron said, you can always change trustees. You can always change beneficiaries. And in New York, Aaron, we have a very <laughs> interesting law. Many states have it. If you get consent of the beneficiaries, you can actually revoke an irrevocable trust. That's correct. And this has to be uh, drafted carefully in the beginning. So this is um, a point where you really need a lawyer and you need a good lawyer and someone who practices in this area. But our clients are often confused by the fact that they can revoke their irrevocable trust. So when you're preparing to protect your assets, as if you're looking at asset protection, Medicaid planning, the particular trust that we've been using and designed, and we keep improving on it as we go, but the trust that I drafted back in 1993 still work because that's when we got the rules that we still live by today. If you're watching what's going on with debts and deficits, both at the federal and state level, Governor Cuomo just gave his state of the state address, um, we have significant deficit problems. We have new Medicaid rules coming into effect that came in, started October 1, they're really coming in April 1 for any Medicaid application for home care filed on or after April 1. And this is bringing us a 30 month look back where we used to have no look back for home care. There are a series of other changes coming in with these new Medicaid rules that are gonna make it much more difficult for individuals to get care in their home, to benefit from care in their home. 
through the Medicaid program. We are working very diligently to get out in front of these new rules. As I mentioned earlier, we've done a, a webinar. We have another one on the 21st at 7 p.m. We had the last one last week. And we'll be covering all of these new Medicaid rules. The key to this is that Medicaid Asset Protection Trust that we can design right now with tremendous flexibility and control is here today. Will it be here next year? We can't promise that. And as the budgets become more difficult and the deficits increase, the pressure to curtail Medicaid eligibility and keep more people off the Medicaid rolls is going to increase. So if you're thinking about doing asset protection planning, or if you know someone who is, the time to get this particular trust in place is now. I've been talking about penalties for Medicaid home care for many years. Everybody said, now nah, you're full of it, Bureau. It's never going to happen. It happened. We now have those rules. So get out in front of it. Get your trust done in advance. Wait out the five years. Sit back, relax, have a glass of wine. Enjoy your retirement. You don't have to worry about asset protection once it's done. All right, we're going to shift gears. I want to now bring on David Wojcicki who is the CPA. He's got his firm here in Latham, New York, I believe on Wolf Road, Dave. Hello, how are you? We're doing well. So taxation is something that clients really need to know. And I think you can click on the screen and take the slides, Dave. I got it. So we get into what's required when you create a trust and the SS4 and all of these other things. Walk us through this and then we'll, we'll look at where the tax laws are today and what people should be thinking about for tomorrow. Sure. So anytime you're gonna form a new entity, the IRS of course is gonna be looking to figure out where they can get their tax money from, from any income generated. Um, and that's driven by an ID number. So as an individual, of course, you've got your social security number. As a separate entity, the first determining factor is do you need a separate ID number for the entity that you form? So for revocable trust, you do not. You need to retitle your assets. And as we talked about before, the key thing is to make sure you change the title of your assets. So it doesn't create a new tax reporting requirement because you're still using your social security number. Most irrevocable trusts, I would say nearly all the ones probably um, that we're talking about with everyone in the audience today is gonna require a separate ID number. We as a firm generally require people, we re recommend people get a separate ID number for an irrevocable trust regardless. And that then requ will require a separate tax return because the IRS will be matching any reporting obligations from an income standpoint to the ID number that now belongs to the trust. So the question is now I've got a separate entity. Where do I file it from a state perspective? All the states are, are a little different as to how they, where you file once you transfer assets to the trust. Some are based on beneficiaries. Some are based on the situs of the trust. Some are based on where the seller of the trust is, and some are based on where the actual residency of the individual who makes the transfer of the assets to the trust is, which is in New York. And that is only really a, uh, a factor if it's a non-grantor trust, and we'll get into the definitions a little later on, and probably most of the trusts that we'll be dealing with will, I would guess, are gonna be grantor trusts. So you'll be filing likely in New York State, just as you do as an individual. There's really three, there's several types of trust, but there's really three we'll be talking about today. And that's the grantor trust, a simple trust and a complex trust. And we'll go through each of the different types of trusts and what they mean a little bit later. Dave, if just one comment on that, with regard to the revocable trust, we just use always the social security numbers of the grantors. Correct. With an irrevocable trust that is a grantor trust, you have an option. You do have an option. You can assign a tax ID number or not. And with a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, because we want Medicaid to look at this as though they have divested those assets, they no longer own them. So we recommend that clients get the tax ID number and use it on all of the new accounts that are being opened up in the trust with one exception. When you have a tax deferred annuity, there are certain companies that if you change the tax ID number from social security to a new tax ID number, they will trigger the tax on the deferred income and you lose all the benefits of that original contract. So we wanna talk, if you have a tax deferred annuity going into an irrevocable trust, you wanna make sure from the company that having a new tax ID number is okay 
many will accept it. If not, leave it in the social security number. There's no reason that you have to use the same pattern on every asset. You can leave the annuity in just the social security number and put every other asset in the tax ID number. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I agree. I, mean, I think the, the reason for getting an ID number, if not required, is just to make it look as a segregation of assets as much as it even is a segregation of assets. So I agree. The estate tax, Lou, we want to chime in on this together or how do you want to handle this? Sure. Uh, this is something very much in play right now because the next slide is going to talk about the Biden tax proposals. But we, we have President Trump who enacted tax legislation that went into effect in 2018, January 1 of 2018. And what that legislation did was it actually doubled the estate tax exemption. So every person watching this that's a U.S. citizen today or a green card holder has an estate tax exemption of $11,700,000. That means that you could give away $11.7 million. So take out your checkbooks, write those checks today, because you can give away $11.7 million without any tax by using your lifetime exemption. In New York, there is no gift tax, but we have an estate tax. So you can beat the New York estate tax by making a gift, provided it's at least three years in advance of your date of death. So the estate tax exemption in New York is $5,930,000. So for a married couple today, you can transfer $23.4 million free of federal gift and estate tax. We have high net worth clients. We have done a lot of planning in the fourth quarter. We're doing more in January of 2021 to utilize and lock in this estate tax exemption. The Trump tax cuts, if you recall, the corporate cuts are permanent, the individual cuts are not. So this exemption gets cut in half automatically at the end of 2025. <coughs> Dave? Yeah, I think, I mean, we, I know we were scrambling around at the end of this year. It's a lot of money, obviously. Not everybody has 11700000 to give away or $23 million. But if you did and you were concerned of it being cut in half and of over $5 million essentially, then, you know, there was a, you really had to take advantage of this. And I, I'm going to be surprised if we don't see a reduction, as we'll get to in a second with under the new proposed tax plan. There's been no. a lot of talk on, on you know, we, we, I mean, Lou, I'm sure you're look, addressing the estate stuff a lot more than we are. We're certainly looking more at the capital gains and uh, shifting income into 2000. Kind of this year was moving income from 2021, potentially back into 2020, which is not normally the strategy you'd look at. You're actually, with the potential rates going up, probably likely to go up, um, and probably something in the capital gains area, I'm not sure where they'll end up. We probably will see something in all of these I don't know about the last two. I'm hoping that doesn't pass, but we'll probably see something in the first four bullet points at least. Yeah, the repeal of the step up in basis is very hard <clears throat> to do. Yeah. Government's done it twice. Both times they repealed it within a year. And so that's a tough one. The Biden proposal for a state and gift tax is to roll back to 2009 levels. What that had was a $3.5 million estate tax exemption and a $1 million gift tax exemption. So if we roll back as Biden has proposed, if your estate is over three and a half million, you're gonna be subject to tax. If you give assets away over 1 million, you're gonna be subject to tax. And we'll just have to see, but a lot of people are out in front of this and doing their planning now to lock in the existing, what is really a windfall exemption at 11.7 million federally. Dave? Okay, the definition, go through each of the three types we talked about, the grantor trust, the simple trust, and the complex trust. Grantor trust, from the IRS pers perspective, if it's considered to be a grantor trust, which is according to the, the provisions of the trust document itself, then all of the income will be taxed to the owner. And really, you'll have a separate tax filing. It's a fairly simple tax filing. All the, in all the taxes and income will be reported on the grantor's individual return. Um, from an income tax perspective, really, you'll see no difference other than the mechanics of how you report it and how you pay it on your tax return. But if you have a grantor trust and you had $1,000 of interest prior to setting up the trust, that same $1,000 that's inside the trust, you'd pay the tax on it as well. And most of the, I, Lou, I would say most of your 
trusts are probably going to qualify as grantor trusts? Yes, almost all of them. Okay. And a simple trust, its definition of a simple trust is a trust that requires that all income be distributed annually to the beneficiaries. So if the trustee is appointed and essentially the trust will say, any income that is produced by the principal assets of this trust gets distributed on an annual basis, that's a simple trust. The money that's passed out, the income that's passed out will be taxable and the income tax will be paid by the individual beneficiaries. The issue and the, the, the caveat there is that what the definition of income is, is a little different in the trust uh, realm and your capital gains actually often will be trapped inside the trust and the tax will be paid by the trust itself. And the rates in the trust are very compressed. So you get to a high bracket at a very low amount. So there is some planning to be done with a simple trust. It's not as uh, not as easy as you can do it in a complex trust, but there you, you have to be careful of any kind of large capital gains inside the trust. Finally, complex trust is essentially what isn't a grantor trust or a simple trust, but it gives the trustee discretion as to how they're going to distribute the income and in principle to the beneficiaries. The income tax is, is solely based on how, uh, how the distributions are made. Some of the income will be taxed to the trust. Some of the income will be taxed to the beneficiaries. And because you're dealing with often children as the beneficiaries, there's a lot of tax planning that can happen in a complex trust scenario because if your beneficiaries are in a lower tax bracket, as opposed to the trust, you often will want to make distributions to push the tax impact out to a lower tax bracket beneficiary. So that's something we look at every year. And there's an interesting hindsight rule that you can rely on to kind of have a look back and see what makes the most sense from a tax perspective. Do I handle the poll? No, you. All right, I don't know how to get the poll up though. Cruz right. will put it up for us. All right. An individual taxpayer pays the maximum rate of 37% once income is over 518.4. A non grantor trust pays the maximum rate of 37% once income is over which of the following amounts? All right, we'll get our answers. 41%, that is a correct answer. The majority, I guess the majority of the four, I mean, the largest answer got it right, that's correct. So that basically, as you can see, that it's a very low amount in the trust area before you get to the top bracket, which is currently 37%, likely to be 39.6. So here's the tax brackets we just talked about the 12,950. You can see, you know, you're, you're hitting the top bracket at 20 at $12,950, whereas on the individual side, it's substantially larger. And this is what we we're talking about before. If you happen to have income in the trust in excess of 12,950, you would strongly consider distributing some income out where likely the beneficiary would be in the maybe the 15% bracket. So there's planning to be done in the in the trust realm. So I talked about before the, you know, the definition of income is a little tricky. When you think generally of income, you think of anything that you make above and beyond what you invested. So if you invest $10,000 $10, and you receive back 15, you're, you, you intuitively would think that you made $5,000. But from a, from a trust standpoint, in, income is divided into principal and income itself, income from a trust perspective. And the way to think about it is if you, if you say to somebody, hey, I'm going to put $10,000 into this account. And whatever it grows above and above the ten thousand dollars is yours. The the principal piece is the ten thousand you initially put in. Anything above and beyond that is income of a certain character, and that's either distributable income, which would be like interest and dividends, or it can be capital gains, which is just the growth of the asset. And we'll talk about the difference in those and how it makes a difference from a tax perspective and also from a trust uh, accounting perspective. So when you make a contribution to the trust, that's Prop, the, the trustees receiving the, the uh, property, that's principal, um, the, you then will invest it or whatever you're doing with the property. It could be real estate, could be 
Uh, it could be cash, it could be stocks, it could be an annuity. Um, it's initially allocated to principal because that's what the trust is initially starting with. That principal then is invested or utilized by the trustee to produce income. That income then is going to be either kept inside the trust, distributed out if it's according to the trust document, or a combination of both of them. So the planning perspective really revolves around what are the various tax brackets, both on the individual side, the beneficiary side, what are the tax brackets on the trust itself, how much income do we have, and then where, where does it make most sense to have the income taxed? There's an interesting rule, the 65-day rule that you see on the screen, which allows the trustee to actually have up to the first 65 days of the following year to decide whether they want to make a distribution and treat that distribution as being made in the prior year. That's unusual for most tax perspective because generally anything you want to have happen has to happen in the calendar year. So if you want to, if you, if you get through to 2020 and you realize that, wow, I have some really big income items I never distributed out, you have until March 5th essentially to make the distributions and you can have allocate all of that amount to the beneficiaries or part of the amount to the beneficiaries. And if you look at the difference in rates, if it was just, you know, let's say $20,000 at 37% on the trust side and maybe 15% on the individual side, it's, it's a 22% difference on $20,000, it's 4,400 bucks. So it really is something to keep an eye on. And we're looking at that now for some of our clients, uh, just trying to get year end reports and see what the income looks like. Because you want to talk to the trustee and find out, does it make sense for obviously non-tax reasons to make distributions to people uh, who actually will be receiving the money? So we're going to come back now and talk about the lifetime administration of trusts. So I will take back the control. There we are. And during your lifetime, as we said, the revocable trust is very straightforward, very simple to administer. So if you are the grantor, you're the trustee, you're the beneficiary, you go about your life, the trust is your alter ego, but it's still you. And everything about that trust is treated as you. Tax purposes, Medicaid purposes, it's all your assets. A revocable trust is really a contingency plan. And there are basically two contingencies that are designed into the trust with significant protective provisions for you in both. What if you become incapacitated? And Aaron, this is a question that comes up frequently and gets litigated frequently. We don't want to litigate it. So in our document, we have a series of provisions yes. to determine incapacity. So generally speaking, your treating physician can uh, certify you incapacitated uh, or uh, a committee of physicians. There's several options for that. A court can determine you incapacitated. Generally, we're trying to avoid that. Um, certainly, it does arise sometimes uh, because incapacity is a spectrum and some people are more incapacitated than others or have a, a greater deficit than others. So sometimes a court determination is necessary. Uh, and disappearance. So if you are uh, missing for a certain period of time, uh, we've had clients who wanted to extend this period of time because they didn't want to be found. But uh, this is also something that can uh, trigger the, your successor trustee to step in and manage assets again for your benefit as your fiduciary. So having a clear definition is very important. And this document is so important because we have so many clients that they lose their capacity, sometimes gradually, sometimes yes. significant events occur <clears throat> and it's very sudden. But once you lose your capacity, what happens to your assets? Who pays your bills? Who takes care of your investments, your property? And if you have a trust and it's fully funded, then your trust has all the provisions that you need. It's gonna trigger that incapacity through your own physician and through a process that is going to be verified. And then your next trustee in line simply steps into your shoes and manages assets during that time period. And if you regain capacity, you simply step back in and take control back over. So if you have an auto accident, you're in a coma for six months, you recover, you come out of the coma, you're covered before the accident, during the period of incapacity and after. Your trust is working for you with your successor trustee and then you again as your trustee. So these provisions there give our clients a significant 
safeguard. Yes, we were trying to keep them out of court and make sure that they have an incapacity plan. You really should only be in court if you did not have a plan for incapacity. So similar provisions apply to the irrevocable trust as well, except your trustee starts right away. But you're going to have similar protections and safeguards in your trust. You're going to be able to collect the income directly. As we mentioned, you can collect the principal indirectly. So the income is going to come back to you as the grantor. You typically have a child or a friend or a family member as your trustee. And ultimately, <clears throat> what's in that trust, the principal goes to the beneficiaries. And we mentioned elimination of the step up and basis rule. If that happens, this won't be the case. But now, everything that comes out of that trust goes to your beneficiaries with a fully stepped up basis. So it works from a Medicaid perspective and a tax perspective extremely well. Sometimes people don't have that trustee that they can rely on. And sometimes situations become very complex in certain trusts. And you may want to call in a corporate trustee, a professional, a fiduciary. And I'm going to call in one right now. John and Mike, if you want to join us. Hello, Lou. Thank you. I'd like to reintroduce uh, Michael Bates, John Brasonis. And Trusco Bank, our sponsor, is a corporate fiduciary. So, John, walk us through what a corporate trustee does, what their role is, and a little bit about how Trusco does it. Sure, sure. And there's, um, and thank you, Lou. There's, there's definitely some benefits to choosing a corporate trustee over an individual in some cases. Um, trust administration itself can be, a, as I said, a long and complicated process. Um, I think this is especially true for irrevocable trusts, uh, depending on the age of the beneficiary, um, the terms of the trust, or even in the case where there may be a charitable beneficiary, um, this trust administration can be perpetual. Um, so it's something that a, tr a corporate trustee, like a bank, would be able to take on where a family member uh, might be burdened by that um, time constraint. Um, uh, we see often when a family member comes to us that's currently acting as a trustee. Um, a lot of the reasons we see them looking to a, a corporate trustee are often they have a full-time job and they realize that the trust administration kind of can also become a full-time job. So um, that they, they're hindered by the time constraints. Um, and also, um, you know, the attention to detail that the trust administration requires. Um, so a bank or a trust company has um, the resources and expertise to administer these trusts that an individual may not have. Um, for example, um, we have a trust accounting system and software that allocates uh, principal and income portfolios of a trust. Um, we have professional investment management, and we also prepare annual fiduciary tax returns for our trusts. Um, you know, uh, one other big advantage is uh, corporate trustees can administer trust in an unbiased manner. Um, often un under the terms of the trust, um, distributions are allowed to, to a beneficiary, but when, that, when there becomes a question on whether that distribution is something that could be properly authorized under the terms of the trust, often it's difficult for a family member to say no, where a bank can act unbiasedly. Uh, we can kind of play the bad guy role and say no, um, and it, it'll alleviate that um, stress in the family dynamic. Um, and, you know, corporate trustees were, were bonded and insured. Um, we're highly regulated both internally within, our, within uh, their respective banks, uh, but also by uh, federal and state oversight. Um, yeah, a couple other advantages, um, you know, specific, speaking more specifically towards Trusco Bank, um, you know, we here provide professional investment management of our trust assets, so we can invest trust within stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Um, if there's uh, special assets, we can uh, work to get valuations of those assets. Um, we invest and in, uphold to the standards of the Prudent Investor Act, uh, which in essence means that we provide a, invest to provide a certain level of income to a current beneficiary, but also seek to grow the trust portfolio for a remainder beneficiary. Um, 
we, again, kind of touching back on um, our ability to act unbiasedly when making disbursements out of a trust. Um, anytime somebody asks for an invasion of principal or a, a distribution of principal, we have a trust committee here at our bank that reviews each request. Um, it's made up of senior members of the bank, and um, we review those in terms uh, under the terms of the trust agreement before making disbursements. Um, and lastly, we uh, again file the and prepare um, any annual federal or state fiduciary tax returns for the trust that we administer. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. He's going to speak a bit about the investment management services that we offer. Thank, thank you, John. Thank you. And thank you, Lou and Aaron, for inviting us, Dave. Thank you. Um, and to everybody listening, Happy New Year to you, and I wish you uh, a beautiful year this year. I'm Michael Bates. I'm a business development officer of financial services at Trusco Bank. And what I kind of just want to touch on, since John has touched on a lot of what a corporate fiduciary does, I want to narrow it down into the investment side. Uh, if we talk about in, the investments in a portfolio, obviously when you're making a choice as to who is going to become your trustee or you're the trustee, a very big part of this, the heartbeat of some of this, is how are we going to invest the money um, that is being left to beneficiaries. So whether you put us in a role of a trustee, a co-trustee, or successor trustee, our concern is in managing your wealth, wealth management. Um, we want to know what your goals are. We want to know what the, what's going on with the beneficiaries. We want to review things with our beneficiaries and then make decisions as we go forward. And that's exactly what we would do here. The investment management or wealth management piece as a corporate fiduciary and a trust department, we bundle that service with the administration service. So it's all done under one fee, which is nice. One fee is simple. It's simpler. So you'll get both from us, uh, the investment management piece as well as the administrative piece. Michael and John, question we get all the time when yep. we recommend a corporate trustee to our clients is what are those fees? What does it cost to have a corporate fiduciary? And what a lot of people don't realize is you're already paying a brokerage if you have managed assets. You're already paying a fee to have those assets managed. And as you said, it's a bundled fee. So can you give us just a, a ballpark of what that is? Sure, it's actually an attachment that has our fee schedule. So please, please download that. But it's a complimentary fee. Uh, it's competitive to what's out there in your brokerage firms out there. The thing is, is you're not getting the administrative side uh, when it comes to managing money for beneficiary beyond the grade. That's just what it, what it is. And so that one fee, whether that be 1%, whether that works out 1%, depending on the volume or the value of the assets, uh, that could be 1%. It could be a little bit more. It could be a little bit less. So it's competitive what others offer. It's just that you're getting the bundled services. And, and that's the point I wanted you to emphasize, so thank you, that when you hire a corporate trustee, you're going to get investment management. You're also going to get all of those fiduciary services that John had talked about, and it's a single fee. So it may be the same as you're paying a brokerage. It may be a fraction of a point higher, but you're getting a full array of services, investment and fiduciary services for that same fee. Plus, you're getting you're getting a lot of of manpower on the job. You have three people on the count, as John mentioned. You're going to or two people on the account, as John mentioned. You're going to have the uh, administrator, but you're going to have a full time uh, investment person. So the advice and the care are all wrapped up into that work. You have the bank's uh, power. It's time to do the job. It's expertise uh, and it's experience. So it does work out well. Just going over the slide bullets. We can manage qualified and non-qualified accounts. Qualified accounts are your IRS sanctioned accounts or tax deferred accounts versus non-qualified accounts. Uh, customize the investment portfolio. Of course, I mentioned that we would discuss uh, with your beneficiaries as we go along what's going on in the markets, what's going on uh, in the economy, what are their needs, and then cater and design and get the feedback to make, to make moves and steps going forward. Annualized detailed statements of income, expenses, and capital gains and losses come from us. Um, we incorporate naturally fixed income, equities, and the consideration of cash in your portfolio and the allocation. We do ancillary bill paying services as well. That's part of trust management. But then let's say that you're a trustee, or let's say that um, we're managing your money 
you're a client, we're not the trustee, you want us to do bill paying services, we can certainly do that. Just bring, bring that up in conversation and we'll work at that. Um, and naturally, the personal financial advisory services are ongoing. So I think the next slide, Lou, gets into estates. It's just another area which I'll go over really, really quickly. It's, it's not so much pertinent to this, um, this workshop, but as a state, we can serve as an executor, co-executor, successor, uh, if, you, if you need one to liquidate the estate. We can work in tandem, of course. We would work in tandem with our attorneys or accountants in performing any administration or estate uh, liquidation services. Uh, preparation of accounting if necessary or just simply the information will return to your tax professional. Um, and then provide additional trust services for, for client satisfaction. So that is pretty much what we do. And uh, if you have any questions, there are handouts. That's the next slide. There are handouts. It's our menu of services. It's also our, our uh, fee agreement. And then we also list some, we gave you some performance. So you certainly want us to perform very well like any other broker would and meet its benchmarks on Wall Street that Wall Street people meet and uh, that's what we're going to do. So performance, three years, five years, six years, seven, ten years out. Uh, we put that and show it to you in our models. It's very good performance. It shows you that we're doing what we need to do and uh, are capable of doing. So for anyone interested, you to download it on our website. Again, go to purelaw.com and you can get all of those materials and all of Trusco's materials. Does Trusco have a presence in Florida, Mike? It does. It has about 50 branches yep. in Florida. That's correct. Or if, uh, if you think about it, it's uh, the way I look at it, it's from Clearwater and a and a rainbow right on over to Vero Beach, cover a lot of territory. And so for clients, we have a lot of them who are snowbirds, they're going to Florida, right. they're up here, they wanna have fiduciary services or management services in both places and banking in both places. Trusco is a hometown bank, but now they cover Florida as well. So if that's where you're wintering, that's something that you can take advantage of. So gentlemen, yeah, thank, thank you, you so much for sponsoring thank and thank you for that presentation, that was great. I'd Thank like you, to bring Lord. Dave Wojcicki back up and give Dave the con again so that he can walk us through tax reporting and accounting issues. Okay. Dave. So conceptually, you know, the a, a trust tax return works similar to an individual tax return in that you have income you pay tax on, you get deductions and what's left, you're ready to check to the government so that they can efficiently use your money, of course. Uh, there's a little bit of a twist in that distributions. If you look at the screen, you collect the income, you take your deductions. There are obviously different tax rules, but conceptually it's the same. You get a an actual deduction for distributions that the trust makes out to the beneficiaries. And you get a very small exemption that is very small. It's either $100 or $300, depending on the, the type of the trust. So if we look at uh, what is how to actually calculate the tax liability, again, the income from the trust is going to be computed based on what the trust assets, what the principal produces. It can be interest, dividends, rental real estate, any kind of business income, anything you think of just like an individual you have on your individual. You're gonna gather all your documents, your income documents, and then you're gonna figure out from a deduction standpoint, what's deductible on the trust return. This is a little different. So anything that you spend from a trust standpoint that you would not have spent had you not been in a trust uh, entity is deductible. So any accounting fees, any legal fees, um, any fiduciary fees for the trustee are deductible. Uh, any interest, just like you would on an individual return, if you have mortgage interest or investment interest, property taxes would be deductible, just like they would for individually. Any other taxes related to income producing property would be deductible. It does have the same limits that the uh, the individual limits were passed uh, in the TGCA, TCJA Act, which is a $10,000 limit in total property taxes. So if your taxes are greater than that, you are going to be limited. And then administrative expenses that are that would be lost on the individual side, specifically those 2% of adjusted gross income uh, uh, and the itemized deductions, they were eliminated under the Trump under Trump's Act. On the fiduciary side or the trust side, they're deductible to the extent they are incurred because you're in a fiduciary setting. So if you would not incur these fees had you just been operating as an individual, then they are directly deductible on the, uh, on the trust return. So we'll walk through quickly on the, uh, just the, the, the actual tax returns themselves and what they look like so you get a feel for 
how the reporting works. You can see in the circled area, you choose the type of trust. You have to figure that out first. And really the three we've been discussing are the simple trust, the complex trust, the third one down, and then the grantor type trust, which you'll see on the sixth choice. You'll check that box. You fill out your ID number. You can see in the upper right-hand part of the screen um, and then fill out all the information on the name of the address of the trust. And then it will bring you to, uh, this is actually the, this is a grantor trust letter. We'll go to the simple trust one next. The grantor trust is, this is the trust. If, you, if you're determined to be a grantor trust, you will fill out the front of the, uh, of the 1041, similar as we just talked about on the prior screen, but there'll be no information, no income information on the front screen. The grantor, again, we talked about the grantor reporting all the income just like they had before, but the IRS is going to need a separate schedule because we have a separate ID number. This is the way to tell the IRS, hey, I'm the grantor. This is a grantor trust. Here's the ID number. And this is all the income that I had in that trust that I'm now going to show on my individual tax return. It allows the IRS to trace the 1099 reporting through the grantor trust letter to your individual return. And if you look at just the description of the income and deduction items, they're very similar to what you'll see on your individual return, the interest income, dividend income, interest expense and in real estate. And it actually, the grantor letter will tell you where to actually report it on your 1040. On the simple trust, this is the front of the simple trust. Um, you can see it works pretty much the same way as an individual would. You have uh, interest income, $750 in this trust, $32,000 in dividends roughly to get total income of $33,500. And then there are the, deduct the deductions that this trust has, interest of 4,500 and taxes of 7,500. That's $12,000 of deductions. And you can see it gets to so a net income, you would think of a taxable income of 21,500. But because this is a simple trust, the trustee says, okay, I netted 21,500. I'm required to distribute that out to the beneficiaries. The trust return actually gets a deduction for that 20, 21,500. And you see on line 21, you get the $300 exemption for total deductions of 21,8, which is the 21,500 distribution plus the $300 in exemption. And you actually pay no tax on the simple trust. So in this case, all of the income is distributed out. So if you look at the 21,500, we go to the actual K-1, which each of the beneficiaries will receive this K-1 from the trustee, from the tax return. And it shows there's the 21,500. The beneficiary would receive this K-1. They would take it to their tax return, their tax preparer and say, hey, I received from some money from the trust. Sorry about that. Some money from the trust that I need to report on my individual tax return. And And that'll end up going on their 1040. So this would this is what the trustee is required to provide, uh, or your if you're the trustee required to provide to each of the beneficiaries. The complex trust. We didn't get well, I guess real quick. Let me just touch on the complex trust. The complex trust will work the similar same way as a simple trust, with the exception of the uh, you will not get the deduction if you don't distribute any money out. So if we look back down on line roughly line 17 you would have net income of 21,500. You would pay income at the tax bracket, top, top bracket, which is a 37% and everything over that 12,000 figure we talked about before. This is when you'd have the conversation and say, do we really wanna pay tax at 37% on a relatively small amount? You would decide, make a decision as a trustee, whether it makes sense to distribute some money out to the beneficiaries. And those complex trust beneficiaries would get the same K-1 that the simple trust beneficiaries did only for the amount that they actually received and was distributed out to them. So definitely tax planning to look at. The returns aren't all that complicated. Uh, specifically, the grantor trust isn't too complicated. The other ones you probably will need a tax professional for and the grantor trust probably at least for the initial year, it makes sense. Well, Thanks, Dave. The trust accounting rules, the trust tax rules are extremely complex. We've tried to boil them down here today in such a way that you could get a feel for what's there, but obviously we can't cover all of the aspects of trusts. The grantor trust while you're alive, Dave, is a pretty simple trust. Yeah. Shouldn't say that. It's a, an uncomplicated trust because a simple trust is a different kind of trust. So the grantor trust has very little that's gonna add the grantor trust letter on an annual basis. When you get to complex trusts, 
And these occur sometimes during lifetime, depending mm -hmm. upon how you construct them. But at death, every, every trust transitions because once the grantor is deceased, the social security number of the grantor is no longer valid. Now you must have a tax identification number for not only the trust, but any subtrust that you're creating because they all become separate taxpayers at that time. And so we do a series of SS4s when the original grantor dies for every trust that's gonna be created within that document. And there is a lot more planning, Dave, required for that complex trust to make sure that you're avoiding those compressed trust brackets and that end of year planning, because a lot of times people don't even get their 1099s yeah. or K1s in time. And you've got that 65 days to make those decisions. So sometimes that becomes a compressed time period. Yeah. I mean, we don't, I wouldn't recommend anybody try to prep a non-grantor trust. It's just a, lot, a little, it's definitely more difficult. We, you know, the grantor trust, sometimes we will, we can walk people through them if we, if we want to help them out and, and help them complete the first one or even one after we've done it. But it's definitely complicated from a simple trust and complex trust. Just the forms are different um, and specifically post, post death for sure. Yeah. And the investment management becomes far more critical because you want to minimize the income tax consequences of the investments if possible. And you're balancing out the needs and, and terms of the trust with regard to the beneficiaries. So sometimes corporate trustees at that stage become more valuable because they have the ability to do the investments and all the interrelated accountings that may be required. Correct. So we're gonna turn now to trust administration at death. And Aaron, when a client dies and they have a trust, sometimes it goes very, very smoothly. When they have a trust, it goes very smoothly, yes. When they do not have a trust, it, it does not generally go as smoothly, certainly not as quickly. So um, assets that are in the, the name of the decedent alone, you have no access to until someone is appointed for the estate. Okay, what that means is you have to take the will and file it, and it has to be admitted to probate and what are called letters testamentary are issued. Those, that's the document that says you have authority to marshal assets, to open accounts, and to find out what's out there. In some cases, we get what are called preliminary letters when we know there's gonna be a problem. Those preliminary letters allow you at least to marshal assets and protect things. They do not allow for distributions. In New York, an estate has to be open for seven months. That's the creditor period, meaning that if there's anyone out there that the decedent owned a debt to, they have to be put on notice. And if they're not, they're still out there generally searching for these things. Uh, at that point, the estate can be distributed if it's ready. Generally speaking, Best case scenario is a year for an estate. Um, certainly two years is not unusual. As Lou said, we've had estates go on for seven, eight, nine years, unfortunately. So um, better just not to be in probate at all. One reason that people do use probate is that you do get a, a statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. So when you close an estate, the executor gets released after a certain period of time, whereas a trust, you don't really have that tolling period. True, but it's going to be generally difficult to go after a trustee in a situation like that as long as they have done what they are supposed to do. Anybody who commits a fraud is certainly going to, uh, knowing that there's a debt out there and uh, avoiding it that is actually due is going to face problems. Um, as we've talked about, there's a lot of probate pitfalls. Uh, complicated assets, for instance, could be a business. So the decedent owned a business uh, solely there may be no succession plan in place or no operation plan. That can be a real problem as far as who can deposit money, who can pay people, who can even just operate the business. Minors we talked about, you get a guardian ad litem, which is a lawyer who has to monitor and make sure that they get what they're supposed to get, create a report. Same with incapacitated and, uh, beneficiaries. Again, it costs the estate money, slows things down. Uh, and means almost certainly that a court appearance will be necessary. Uh, Predeceased beneficiaries can be an issue, meaning that we have to prove that they're actually dead. I know that uh, sounds strange, but in a recent case, we had 84 potential distributees because a lot of people had, had died and there were a lot of cousins, there weren't siblings. Um, so we had to prove which of those 84 people were actually dead. 
uh, pretty much a nightmare. I don't know how else to describe that. It was. Um, charities, so uh, leaving money to charity is obviously a good thing, but if you leave a percentage of your estate to a charity, uh, the AG, the Attorney General's Office, is going to come in because they're charged with making sure that the charity gets what they're supposed to get and review, and we're going to require an accounting to show how everything was spent and maybe have objections to those expenses. So generally speaking, we recommend that people leave a flat dollar amount to a charity if they do do that, but um, everybody has to make their own call on that. Talked about creditors. Disharmony can be just simply, I don't trust my brother, I don't trust my sister, or there's a stepmother or a stepfather, uh, which can lead to all sorts of issues about whose property was joint property, whose property wasn't joint property, or whether you know your brother spent mom and dad's money to buy his car. So all of that can take a very long time. Costs. So probate is uh, generally an expensive process, certainly much more expensive than a trust administration. There's a filing fee, uh, which can be over $1,000, depending on the size of the estate. Usually filing fees are not that high, but um, more typically it's $250 or $650, which is not a little bit of money. If we don't know who someone's heirs are, we have to publish, which means we're in those legal notices in the back of the paper that no one ever really reads, and it has to be done in certain places and so many times. That's an expensive process. Uh, an executor is entitled to commissions. Those would be um, payout commissions and serving commissions, uh, which can add up. Legal fees certainly add up in the probate process, especially if it's a contested estate. Service, so if we have to serve a citation on people, that's another cost. Sometimes we need a bond if there's uh, allegations that money is missing or um, some, some reason a bond is required, which for instance, the premium on a bond for about $100,000 was $6,000. It's not, it's not a little bit. Um, you may need an accountant or an accounting, which is going to cost more money. We may need appraisals and on and on from there. So trusts operate without probate, manage the assets during life. You have a co continuity which is a big advantage, especially if you have assets that need active management like a business. So for business owners, revocable trusts are absolutely essential to make sure you have continuity in the management of that trust. You have successors and the financial affairs remain private. Uh, probate is a public place. You can get anybody's will. You can go in and examine their probate file. It's all public document. There's no confidentiality there. So obviously we think trusts are a better overall plan for our clients. If clients are younger, they maybe are in their 30s, 20s, then wills are probably more appropriate. But as clients age and get nearer to retirement, the value of the trust becomes much, much more important. Absolutely. So revocable trust administration, when one spouse dies, it depends upon how it's drafted. If we're doing tax planning, that's going to be built into the trust and we're going to have credit sheltering. But at $5,900,000 for the New York State exemption and a federal exemption of 11.7, not many clients fall into this. But if you do, then you should have at least some contingent tax planning, like a disclaimer or a qualified terminable interest property trust, a Q-tip, where we can put in post-mortem planning. We can actually allow the flexibility that the tax planning goes into effect based upon the value of assets and tax law in effect after death, you get to do the planning, and that's when you know the circumstances. Distributions to beneficiaries, revocable trust at the second spouse's death is an easy fix. Yes. <coughs> there we're going to, uh, whoever the beneficiaries are, all right, maybe uh, their children, maybe their uh, charities. Um, there, though, this is generally very easy. Um, we could divide up an account. Uh, we can have it remain in the form that it is. Sometimes we're doing a continuing trust here, or in our advice, we should almost always be doing a continuing trust here because you can do something that someone cannot do for themselves and that's asset protect the money. Don't so this has become really a staple in our practice and it's based upon an evolution of case law. When I, I said earlier in New York, you can't protect assets in your own trust. It's against public policy but you can protect assets when you create a trust for someone else, whether it be a trust during lifetime or upon death. So we think a lot about special needs trusts and special needs situations. And certainly you wanna make sure you have a trust in place there, but literally for any 
individual. And for my three children, when my wife and I are gone, they're going to each get a trust from us. And that trust we call a beneficiary control trust, which does protect it from creditors, spouses, divorces, all of those purposes. And yet it leaves my children in control of their own trust. And third party trusts, Aaron, are a wonderful gift to give your kids. Absolutely. So they're creditor protected. That means that uh, they can't be reached by a lawsuit. All right. But the number one creditor out there is a future ex spouse. These remain in the bloodline. If your son or daughter passes on and they have children, it continues on down to their children and never leaves your bloodline. Where if you leave it to a son or daughter outright, generally their will or trust is going to control that interest and they're going to say where it goes. So we'll bring Dave back up because you have a series of tax filings when someone dies. You, the last individual decedent's return, then trust returns. Dave, you want to walk us through that? Sure. So when someone someone passes, you have a, uh, a final return for the 1040, um, which also has a, I run into this issue, if someone dies, for example, if someone were to die January 8th, 2021, would you need to file a 2021 return? And likely not, because you're, there's still an income threshold. If you're not above a certain income threshold, there's not a requirement to file a final 1040. But for the most part, you're probably going to have to file a final decedent return. Um, the estate then also, remember, and, and date of death, we have the ending of the social security number and the ending of the individual tax return, and then you create a new entity, which is the estate entity, which will have a new ID number, and therefore it creates a new reporting entity. That entity can choose to be taxed on a calendar year. So if someone were to pass away July 30th, they could have a calendar year, or they could have a fiscal year that would end on the 12 months, the month that ends the following year, uh, from date of death. Finally, a big issue really is surrounding uh, the estate uh, threshold. We talked about the, the exemption right now, which is quite high um, for one person, 11,700. But if you want to claim portability so that you get both exemptions, you actually need to file an estate tax return. So if someone passes with $7 million or $2 million in assets, we generally have a, uh, a, a tax return of 706 filed just so that we can claim the portability so that the second spouse or the, the remaining the surviving spouse can use the, whatever is left uh, from the estate exemption. And you don't get that portability without actually filing a tax return, which is a little bit of a pain in the neck, but um, it and is required. The ET706 is the New York state portion of that. And remember, New York's exemption is currently $5,930,000. If you are substantially under that, you probably don't have to file, but again, for certain purposes like electing portability, you may want to do that. What happens if the Biden proposal goes through and we drop to a three and a half million dollar exemption? You wanna make sure that you plan in all events for those types of tax law changes. In New York, you, the ET706, if you trip, go over just the border to Massachusetts. If you happen to be in Massachusetts, Massachusetts has a $1 million yeah. state tax exemption. So a lot more estate tax return work, Dave, and mass than there is here, because a million dollars is a, is a threshold that a lot of people broach. And you want to make sure that you get good advice, because I mentioned earlier post mortem tax planning, and that can involve income tax, capital gains tax, estate and gift tax. You want to look at all of those different options and get a good quality consultation to make sure that you're considering all of those things in terms of your final plan. Yeah, I think two items probably come to mind the most we deal with on the, the, uh, the final tax return. That's savings bonds. If the beneficiaries are gonna cash savings bonds, you have the ability to accrue the interest back to the final decedent's return. And mm -hmm. that often can make a big difference, especially if the decedent were to pass away on an earlier part of the year. Otherwise, the beneficiaries will pick up uh, all of the interest related to those savings bonds. And then just the timing on making uh, expense, you know, the payment on expenses, which is either could be legal fees, could be medical expenses. When you pay them in relation to when the year ends can make a big difference because you either can have the benefit of those expenses or you'll completely lose them or the beneficiary can get the benefit of those expenses. So there is a lot of planning around the final year specifically. Absolutely. And the next slide talks about the accounting requirement and we want to make sure that if an accounting is required, 
This applies in most of our charitable cases, as Aaron said, if there's a percentage. But when else are accountings required, Dave? Well, if the court requires it, and if it's not waived, it's not, uh, you know, if it's specifically stated in the trust agreement, you can re require it. But most of the time, it's on specific trust where the court's requiring and someone's in charge of, could be a supplemental needs trust or, you know, an appointed guardian type. Uh, but it is expensive. Yeah. Accounting, so people don't realize. We always waive the accounting requirement in our documents. But if a beneficiary demands it and the court orders it, then you're going to be forced to account. And that's going to go back many, many years. Yeah. In terms of accounting for every transaction, every stock trade, all of the dividends, and it is quite an onerous burden to prepare a full formal accounting. So that wraps our estate admin and trust admin. What if you want to keep current on a year over year basis? We have a program at our firm called our Professional Advocates Lifetime Maintenance System or POMS. And through our POM system, we meet with our clients every year and we update them on the law as we're doing today, but with regard to their own personal situation. And I can't emphasize enough that every individual situation is unique. You all have different planning issues. You all have different planning requirements, different families, different assets. And so there is no one size fits all trust. And you wanna make sure you're taking, in, taking into account the tax law and the substantive law of trusts with all of these considerations in mind. We, we track all of the data, the assets, the values, the properties, the businesses. We spreadsheet all of that for our clients and we sit each year and go through all of those options and make recommendations for improvements on the plan. And sometimes it doesn't happen and sometimes it does. So form 12, you'll see our Palms Agreement and that's something that you can take a look at. And if you're interested, in being in the annual maintenance program. We're very happy to talk to you about that. And next we have a poll, our wrap up poll. If we can get that up, Bruce, here we are. So if you're interested in learning more about trust planning with Pierre O'Connor and Strauss, let us know. This is not mutually exclusive, or you'd like to learn more about tax planning with David Wojcicki or trust administration with Mike and John, let us know and we'd be happy to arrange a complimentary consultation for you so that you can get information and more importantly, get a consultation. We do have a questionnaire that you can download from our website. That's a great starting point or a state planning questionnaire that will get us all the information, Aaron, that we need to sit down with you and go through all of these concerns and considerations for your family, you and your personal assets. So with that, our next trust workshop is gonna be April 22nd. If you've benefited from it and you think others will, please let them know. We'll be publicizing and advertising that if you'd like to sit in again. If we have more tax law changes, we'll cover them at that with the Biden proposals that will be coming out. And as always, we welcome you to call us or email us and we'd be happy to sit down with you and talk.